that I would speak on five topics and as I was preparing something interesting happened that I was thinking of saying certain things and I have certain quotes and they could have gone in any one of those five presentations. So they're very connected. So there may be a little repetition of concepts which is not a problem because it's all one thing. You know that thing between your ears? Yeah, that thing. That's what we're going to do. Um, that could be a problem or it could be an asset, depending on how it's used. 
So, today's topic is on the board, The Greatest Obstacle Ourselves. And it's so cliche, especially in this time, mind is a friend, mind is enemy. Sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So we always say it. And often what happens is, if you say something enough, you can be guaranteed you do not understand it and take it for granted. Have you noticed that? Yeah. So I think a lot of that happens in learning our philosophy. Like, you get it, like the third week you're in Iskand. You, I got it, I understand that. And then you think you've got it. And you actually have it, because it's very deep. And another phenomena, which Prabhupada explained, was that sometimes we think we get it because it's simple. But we actually miss the essence. So Prabhupada said, it's so simple you can miss it. So this presentation, in one sense, is very simple and basic, but on another level, it, it open, uh, hopefully will open you up to things you haven't considered about this topic. So the way I would like to do this, I will, I will show the PowerPoint. I saw Rampad Swami's PowerPoint. I didn't have one. I thought, oops, I better have one. <laughs> but, um, generally, I try to do um, things which are more we're more exploring ourselves and requires less brain work and intellect than, than more transformational and introspective. But there's a lot of quotes on here, so it's good that it's on a PowerPoint because you can reference them or write them down. So the way I would like to organize everything that I'm doing, I'm doing five programs, is that I either have a PowerPoint or I won't, but I will speak for a while. And then I'll give you an exercise, which we'll do for a while. And then after the exercise, we'll unpack it, you'll share your realizations, we'll have discussions and questions. And in my experience of facilitating, it's the exercise and the unpacking of the exercise where you get the most. Not for me speaking, because as we've often heard, you only remember 7% of what you hear. So that means 93% of what I say, you will totally forget. <laughs> Believe it or not. Anyway, but a lot of what I say you already know, so it's hard to forget what you already know, but hopefully I can maybe shed some light on it. So are you ready? Are you ready? Yes! Okay, just check in, you're still breathing. I do that periodically, so if I ask you a question, Please respond because I'll keep asking until I hear every voice respond. Okay. Prabhupada was once asked, What is the devotee's greatest enemy? To which he replied, He himself, because he's a rascal, he's his greatest enemy. So just get out of this rascal dome and you become your friend. Nobody is enemy. You are yourself your enemy. Morning walk, June 12th, 1974, Paris. Wow, how does that make you feel? Well, it kind of, you know, it's, the problem is very clear right now, isn't it? Nobody's, nobody's enemy. Have you ever thought someone is your enemy? Yes or yes? yes. Of course. We have lots of enemies, don't we? They're all out there, and sometimes material nature is the enemy, and next door neighbor is the enemy. And Prabhupada's saying, no. And that's there in the Bhagavatam. Right? Maybe it's 11. The same idea. Could you put it on the presentation? Oh, it's not big enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just so, presentation icon. Yeah. Um, oh, I'll just... My phone is covering the presentation, but I can... <laughs> no. Oh, okay. Very good. So, um, so this point is very important. First, to distinguish that every time we think the problem is outside of us, Prabhupada said, there's no problem outside. It's inside. Bhagavatam also says, some people say this is the problem, that's the problem. I think maybe it was a Vanki problem. And he said, no, the only problem is the mind. So that's good to know. So that's where we're starting. Whose mind is the problem? Your wife's? Your husband's? 
<laughs> yeah, Prabhu, my wife's mine. No, no. Prabhupada didn't say that was the problem. Your, your mind is the problem. Okay. Do we get that? Whose mind is the problem? Mine is not work. Yeah, okay. Nobody else. It may seem like that they're the problem, but the point Prabhupada is making is how you respond to, to whatever is going on is going to either help you or hurt you. So your mind is going to be like, uh, have, have the, you know, imagine a spaceship, all the energies, the engines under, it's bringing you up. Your mind's going to bring you up or it's going to bring you down. And who's going to decide if your mind is going to bring you up or down? Who makes that decision? So now we can end class. You've got the essence. <laughs> Maha Prasadi Govinda. <laughs> Why waste time in details? You know, that, that's basically it. Okay. But it may take uh, 24 more slides to convince you that that's actually it. Okay. But most of you know this, maybe all of us know this. Uh, Prabhupada was asked, why is, why is Maya so strong, Prabhupada? Because your purpose is not strong. So this is interesting. Have you ever blamed Maya for being in Maya? Let me guess. Uh, Let me guess. Yes? <laughs> Possibly? Yeah. Okay, so... This is from a movie called Credo. And I have to tell you the scene. Yes, it's really good. Uh, you don't have to watch the movie. <laughs> I'll tell you what happened. So, you see two people in this picture. One is a boxer and one is his coach. And as the story goes, the coach was formerly a boxer who killed this young man's father in the boxing arena. And he had it in him to go and be trained by him to become world champion. And he lost his first attempt at being world champion. And now they're having a dialogue. And the dialogue before this scene is the coach is saying, I will not, he wants a rematch. The person who he lost to is the world champion and he wants a rematch. And his coach is saying, no, don't do it. And he's saying, I want to do it, I have to do it. The coach is saying, no. And then the boxer, I guess his name is Credo, because that's the movie on Credo. Yeah. So the boxer says, what, you don't think I can beat him? And the coach says, he just says, no. In other words, that's not what I think. So then why did you want to coach me? So he's asking this question. He says, stand up and start sparring. There's a mirror there over the whole wall. He says, start sparring. Sparring. So he's doing this in the mirror. And the coach says, the problem is not that you can't defeat the boxer. The problem is, I don't think you can defeat this person in the mirror. That's the person you need to defeat, not the boxer. So therefore we have this same statement here, the only person we have to conquer is the man in the mirror. Which goes with the statement of Prabhupada saying the problem is nobody and nothing else outside. So this is... This is very powerful, especially when we think the competition is outside, the problem is outside. So what does it mean, we're the only ones we have to conquer? Well, we'll we're going to do an exercise to help you clarify it. But think about your fears, think about how you limit yourself. Think about things you have done which were harmful to you, or may still be doing. Think about the temptations you've given in. All these kinds of things. Who are we trying to conquer? We're trying to discipline ourselves. We're trying to control ourselves. We're the ones we're competing with. There's nobody else. So this is very important. If we live our life trying to conquer ourselves, that's the best phrase I can get for now, conquer ourselves, discipline ourselves, overcome personal problems, limitations, defects we inherited from the last life, we learned in this life. We know what they are. We know, you know what your weakness is, right? You must know. Unless you're 
trying to deceive yourself. You know what they are. That's what you have to conquer. You know what your fears are. You know how you limit yourself. You know, you know how sometimes you're not attentive to details when you should be, you're not on time when you should be, etc., etc. These are the things we have to do. That's, that's where the work is. It's not that your next door neighbor got, got a better job and that in any way affects you. It doesn't. It has nothing to do with you. You are just trying to be a little better than you were yesterday. Thank you. Right? You may never be as good as the next door neighbor, but you're not, you're not competing with them. You're competing with yourself. Maya is not the problem. It is our submission to Maya that is the problem. So, my dear ladies and gentlemen, please don't ever blame Maya again for anything. And please don't blame your mind. Oh, Prabhu. Why did you do that? Oh, Prabhu, my mind, it's so heavy, it's so strong. Oh, yeah, that's a good excuse. Oh, oh. You couldn't do anything about it, is that what you're saying? Yeah, Prabhu, my, if you had my mind, you would know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, one time, everybody was complaining to Prabhupada, you know, like this. He was saying, oh, Prabhupada, it's so difficult to control the tongue. Prabhupada said, yes, I know. I also have a tongue. <laughs> so you think it's not difficult for anyone to control his tongue? But we have Ramapan Swami here. He was a saint from the age of one day, right? He never had a problem in his life. I mean, look at him. How could he? I mean, he's so Krishna conscious. That's how we think. Why is he Krishna conscious? Because he didn't give in to the problems. That's why. We all think, no, he never had any problem. How could he not have a problem? You know, just became a devotee, brahmachari, sannyasi, <coughs> no problems. It doesn't work that way. He didn't give in to the problem. He didn't make excuses. He didn't blame it on his mind or what. That's the idea. So don't blame your mind and don't blame Maya because you have control over both. Did you know that? You can control both. Even all of you who say, my mind, I can't control it. It's not true. Your mind is true. So, these are little statements that I made. This is not a problem. But Maya does not come uninvited. We are the ones who invite her. And we are the ones who can choose to invite Krishna. So, um, if you ever feel that Maya is, is strong, take the sign off the door to your house. Maya is welcome here. Because that's what's happening. And put up the sign, Maya is not welcome. That's all that's happening. So, oh, I'm conditioned. Yeah, yeah okay. But still, conditioned or not, we can't invite Maya, because if we do, then subsequent problems will ensue. This is a letter, June 16, 1969. As your beloved spiritual master and father, it is my duty to give you all protection. But if you allow Maya to act upon you without any resistance, then it is your own choice. Can't blame Maya, because Prabhupada said it very clear right here. It's your own choice. We're choosing to be a Maya. Did you ever feel like you were choosing to be a Maya? Probably not. You just felt like Maya came and chose you, right? Why didn't she chose Rom Romapas when she chose you? Because he has the sign of Maya not allowed here. You have the sign. My allowed, right? One time devotee went to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, please give me your mercy so that I can, and I think it was so I can understand your book, your teachings, your books. He said, my teachings is my mercy. Rana Swami gave a class, like one of those standard three-hour classes, and then a devotee came and said, Maharaj, give me your mercy, and he said, that's what I just did for the last three hours. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we can't sidestep it and think you know, there's some mystical thing that, you know, the Guru just says, mercy, and all of a sudden, mind is controlled. You, you can just sit back and relax, and Maya's like, you know, you're off her list. It's kind of like that, but not exactly. It takes a little more work. 
So, um, so many times Prabhupada said, when a devotee left, he said, what can I do? Right. I, yeah. I, what can the guru do? He can only give you, the, you know, what can the GPS do if you don't follow it? You know, is it, is it complain, send it back? No. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So this is entitled spiritual suicide, which seems to be a contradiction because you can't kill the soul. So this is from Adarshan, 1977, May 13th. So you voluntarily accept this cycle of birth. Don't accept Krishna. Then who can help you? If you have decided to cut your own throat, how can I help you? You will do it. Whenever you will get opportunity, you will cut your throat. How much I can give you protection. That is going on. They have no faith in the words of Krishna. So, this, this concept of spiritual, basically it's self-destruction Prabhupada's talking about. But we, I call it spiritual suicide, atmahana, you get that, killing the self. So Prabhupada's main point here is, is very clear. If we want to not follow Krishna, who can help us? If we want to kill ourselves, we go off alone somewhere, we take the knife, nobody can stop us. Hare Krishna. Okay, now, before we read this, I have to explain. Envious of oneself. This is such an interesting statement. Because how can you be envious of yourself? Because envy means you want something that someone else has and you don't like it that they have it. It doesn't make sense that you could be envious of yourself. In Sanskrit, sometimes... The word for envy is dvesha. Dvesha means hatred. And sometimes, the way Prabhupada uses the word envy is violence, because, because Prabhupada said, we're envious of the cows. Raise your hand if you're envious of cows, or you want to be a cow. No, what Prabhupada meant is we're killing cows. So we're violent, envy, violent. So when Prabhupada says, envious of oneself, it's this concept of self-destruction self-hatred, self-envy. I wrote a chapter in my book on this and the devotee, the god sister who was, who was editing it, she said, this is all a bunch of new age hodgepodge, self-envy, self-compassion, all this stuff. I said, no, it's in Prabhupada's books, in his letters, in his lectures. She goes, no, no, it's not, this is all bogus. You know, and then I gave her, gave her all the quotes. It's there, Prabhupada talks about it. So let's read. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita, Isopanisha, Bhagavad Gita verse, and yes, of, them own, of their own selves. So, but, but it means, um, you'll see in the context how, how it's used in the, in the last quote and this quote. It's basically, we're hating ourselves, whether consciously or unconsciously, because we're doing, we're performing acts which are destructive. Srila Prabhupada was once in a conversation on June 28, 1976. In your books, you mentioned that if one does not take time to understand how his activities are producing his next life, then one actually becomes envious of his own self. Can you further explain that? You're wondering why there's a dog there, right? Now you'll find out why. Yes, if he's going to become a dog next life, and if he does not take precaution, then is he not envying himself? In other words, destroying. Not, you're doing something which is working against your self-interest. You now have Krishna consciousness. You don't take to it. You live like an animal, you become an animal. That's self-destructive. That's self-hatred in that sense. Does that make sense? I, I, um, I guess what, there's a section there's a section I think the last talk I do is on, on self-acceptance it's, it's kind of like to make sense of this but just to give you a preview because I've taught Japa so much I notice that sometimes when devotees chant they don't really care if they chant well or not they don't really try to hear and listen and pray and so forth 
And in many cases, or at least some, if not many, I would talk to them and I'd say, why don't you care? If you cared more, your rounds would be better. Because I noticed that every devotee who is advancing steadily in Krishna consciousness cares very much about their sadhana. Isn't it, Ramala? It's like, you know, don't talk to me, I'm chanting. You know, it's like, you know, you're very careful. I've got to get up early. i got to do this. Isn't it? You take care of your sadhana. Right? And so, I would try to help devotees be more self-caring. And when they were more self-caring, their japa got better. Who would, who would guess? By self-care you could improve japa. But it, it, it's connected. You have to care enough to do it. Sometimes the mind is very difficult to control and sometimes we don't feel like chanting. And we have to care about our spiritual lives enough to do it. So, anyway, I think the point is clear. Here's a quote from Prabhupada about choice, because this is where this whole discussion is really is going to end up with choice, the concept of choice and how powerful it is. How can these boys, who have been trained to practice these four items from the beginning of their lives, give them all up? Everything is possible, provided we make the choice. So it's a, it's a good point. Prabhupada would sometimes use us as examples. They weren't raised this way. How are they doing it? They've made a choice to take the Krishna consciousness. So Prabhupada is, is showing us here the empowerment of making a choice. How powerful it is to make a decision. Everything in our lives where we've gone or we haven't gone is because of the decision. Decision we made or decision we failed to make. That's a sign of bad management. Right, Ramana? It takes you 20, uh, 19 years to make a decision and you still haven't made it yet. I read from one of the top managers in the world, he said, the symptom of a good organization is how quickly they make decisions. And one uh, general made a decision that no one before him made. In like 50 years, nobody could make the decision. They gave him a 500-page book delineating the pros and cons. He read about 70 pages and made the decision. And his subordinate said, how could you make a decision? No one has been able to make the decision. And he said, how will I know if my decision is right or wrong unless I make it? So, Because he was asked, how do you know it's the right decision? He said, I don't know, but I'll find out very soon. Because <laughs> I made it. <laughs> so, so to not make a decision is also a decision not to make a decision. Right? So don't, I, if, if you don't choose, like this one man told a story he was, it was cold, it was snowing outside, and he was a little kid, and he was playing, and he was going in and out of the house, and he was leaving the door open. And his mother said, just decide if you want to stay in or out, and if you don't decide, I will decide for you. So Maya is saying the same thing to us. Just decide if you want to be a devotee or not, because if you don't decide, I will decide for you, and you know what I will decide. Right? So when you don't make a decision, it's, we're allowing Maya to make a decision. An uncontrolled mind is like a disease. If not cured, it will continue to harass one. So the, the mind is what's keeping us in the field. Well, imagine your worst enemy was surgically connected to you and you couldn't escape. Everywhere you go, this enemy goes with you. And so I think you understand what's going on, right? If you actually love yourself, you will make your mind your greatest friend and well-wisher. But if you allow your mind to be an enemy, then we could say you're, you actually are destroying. You could say in a sense you hate yourself. Because that mind is, is very powerful and it can help us in so many ways. And we're going to talk more about that in a section. I think we do a section on beliefs. Now sometimes we're trying to do something, but our mind is working against us and we can't succeed, although externally we did everything. It's like, why am I failing? Because the mind is working against us. The enemy. And then, later today, I mean the obvious question is, why do I have a mind that works against me? It doesn't make any sense, does it? Like, why would my mind work against me? you ever ask that question? Stay tuned. 3.30, we'll get the answer.
um, when we talk about conditioning. So, this slide is the power of I decide. Whether the mind becomes the friend or enemy is our decision. I decide. So, this is a little mantra that I want to give you. I decide. It's, it, I'll, you'll understand why I'm giving it to you in a minute, but just, just for now, I decide. And it will be explained what it means, I decide. Because a lot of times in our life, we don't decide. Who decides? One of the lower modes of nature decides, and then we just act according to that. Where we could have decided not to act that way, but we don't. And sometimes we even think we can't decide, that we're impelled. You know, I had an issue with a devotee in 1986. I had a big issue. This devotee really let me down. And I thought I could not feel any different about him. I thought the feeling I had towards him, which was betrayal and extreme disappointment at what he did, I thought that feeling was going to remain with me for the rest of my life. That's how I thought. That's just, just how I feel. It's, I didn't choose to feel that way. It's just how I feel. And then I read a book on forgiveness. I'm like, like one of the first things it said is, you can choose to forgive. And I said, no, you can't. This is, I, I'm, I can't choose to forgive him. That was my illusion. I didn't think I could choose to feel a different way about him. I didn't think I could choose to think differently about him. And by studying and teaching forgiveness, that was one of the, the basic premises. You can choose. And because if you can't choose, there can't be any karma. Because how can you be responsible for something you can't choose? Right? Doesn't make sense, does it? You can't choose how to act, how could you be responsible? Right? You, know, you go down this street, it's the only street you can go down, you get a ticket. You're on the wrong street, but there was no other street. That doesn't make sense. Anyway, it will be explained further in these slides. Jiva Tattva means minute independence, therefore we have choice. So Krishna is given a little choice. And that's good. And a lot of people complain, Krishna, why did you give me choice? Right? Because you know, if you didn't give me choice, I wouldn't have been here, and I wouldn't have created this mess. Anyway, that's for another class. But the fact is you have choice to get out of here. So use, maybe you misused it, now you can use it. So choice is good now, right? Isn't it? <laughs> you may give in to temptation, but that is also a decision. And I know we don't always think about it's a decision, but I want you um, to start thinking in those terms because it will help you. Choice, decision, I decide it's my choice, even when you feel impelled by the modes of nature. Even if you're in the mode of ignorance, which basically your willpower is like, like a little spark instead of a fire, but even in the mode of ignorance, you still can choose to get out. Just like they have this 12-step program, and the 12-step program is for people who are addicted to certain behaviors, behaviors or substances who can't on their own get out. But what they can do is they can get... What, what they can do is they can get to the 12-step program. That much independence they have. They don't have the power without that program. They're addicted. They can get to the 12-step program they can pray to God, please help me. That much they can do. So you always have that choice. Even if you're a drug addict, alcoholic, whatever. Because the 12-step program is based on the fact you don't have the power to overcome your addiction. If you did, you would have overcome it already. But what do you have the power to do? You have the power to follow the program that can help you overcome the addiction. So you always have choice. Even in the mode of ignorance. <laughs> You are above the mind. So this is where the decide, the, the mantra, I decide, starts to make more sense. This is from the uh, fourth chapter, 42nd verse. The working senses are superior to dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is still higher than the mind. And he, the soul, is even higher than the intelligence. Text 43. Thus knowing oneself to be transcendental to the material senses, mind, and intelligence, O mighty armed Arjuna, 
one should steady the mind by deliberate spiritual intelligence, Krishna consciousness, and thus, by spiritual strength, conquer this insatiable enemy known as lust. The old version of Bhagavad Gita said one should conquer the higher self by the lower self. 342. Three, 342. They're both 342? No, 342 and 342. Ah, ah, thank you. Minor details. <laughs> um, okay, I'll change it later. Thank you for that. So, in the original Bhagavad Gita, it said, conquer the higher self by the lower self. And Prabhupada looked at it and goes, what is this higher self, lower self? Somehow I didn't like that, so Prabhupada. The people who don't like editing, that's something Prabhupada didn't like, interestingly. So, um, anyway, so the point that's being made in these two verses is that because we are transcendental of the mind and senses, we can decide, we can instruct the mind via intelligence. If we don't do that, the mind just goes off on its own. And that's when we feel like I have no control. And if you want to be Krishna conscious, you can't live a life with no control. It doesn't work. Obviously. Whenever confronted with temptation, remember this mantra, I decide. Right? And that bag of potato chips is staring you in the face. And when I'm at night, and you're starving, and your intelligence says, don't eat it. And your mind says, I will just have one potato chip. <laughs> and your intelligence says, never in your life have you ever eaten one potato chip. <laughs> and the last time you said that, you ate three bags of potato chip. <laughs> Don't trust it. Always remember, you can make a decision. You're not under the control of your mind because you're not the mind. You're above it. One time, uh, a devotee friend of mine was in the store and her kid, was probably like five, was going just having tantrums and wanted something and she was trying to, she was starting to give in and another mother came by and said, just take control of him. You're the mother. You're in charge, not him. <laughs> and it's just, just like that with the mind. And the mind's going, Bruh! you have to say, okay, who's in charge here? I am. No potato chips. We're going to bed. You can do that. So, I just want to let you know that you can do that. I know it's a simple concept. You wouldn't believe how powerful this concept is. Just this mantra, I decide, when you're in those moments, when the mind is taking you in the wrong way. And usually when the mind is doing is it, it is taking us away from what we know is right, from how we want to be and how we want to live. So it's really an alienation, isn't it? So it's very painful to do something when you know it's the wrong thing. It's one of the most painful experiences. So the mind, if we take, if we decide, then we can live a very peaceful life. And we don't have to live this paradox of, of thinking one thing, of giving in. Not that we won't think of it. We will think of these things. Um, especially in younger stages of devotional service, but giving into it. So we're going against what we know. What could be more painful than that? And what is more satisfying than to live what you believe? to live your values, to live what you know. And then you become a devotee and every day you go to class. You should do this, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this, you should do this. You do like a 350 you shoulds every class. You know, that sets you up for a lot of guilt when you don't do it, right? So, you know, you have to be careful when you study Shastra because Shastra is implanting within you the right, the right attitudes, the right behavior, the right values which if you don't do, it just makes you feel worse. Like the more you know, the worse you feel, because you're not doing it. And, you know, before we were devotees, a lot of devotees say, well, before I was a devotee, I never criticized anybody, I was just happy, you know, yeah. because your standards were like, you know, 12 feet underground. And your, friend, your friend comes back, and oh, last night I got drunk, stood up, and I'm like, cool. And, yeah, so what you, why would you criticize anything? Because the more degraded, the better. When you become a devotee, now you have all these standards. You know. oh, Prabhu, why, why didn't you do this? You know, we're getting upset with people and criticizing. Hare Krishna. 
You can stop all that. You can control that. You can do what you're supposed to do. But you have to, you have to build the mus muscle of decision. And I think too many of, too many of us give in to those. Prabhu, right there in the bottom of the unit, says the modes do everything. I do nothing. You know, like <laughs> classic, you know, Bhakta Burfi interpretation of Shastra, you know, to rationalize all his mind. I want to make a series of the adventures of Bhakta Burfi. He's like really good at misunderstanding Shastra. So we're going to do an exercise now. Can you all get a partner, like whoever you're next to? Just Partner means two, because if there's three, then you can't talk to one another. It takes longer. So just turn towards your partner, and I'll, we'll do a quick exercise, and then we'll go on, and then at the end we'll do another exercise. So if you don't have a partner, you might have to stand up and find one. <laughs> So if you're sitting alone, if you're sitting alone, look around and see, find someone else who's sitting alone. Okay. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. I didn't tell you what to do yet. <laughs> You guys are very creative. You created your own exercise. <laughs> um, so, you have to choose who's partner A and B, and partner A will go first. And you tell partner B five things you can't do. Not things which are physically impossible. Like, I, I can't jump to the moon, I can't lift 10,000 feet. No, we already know you can't do that. But like, you know, I can't get up from a malarkey. I, I can't read more than an hour a day. I can't concentrate when I chant. Things like that, those can't. So, partner A will tell partner B, five I can'ts, then partner B will tell partner A, five I can'ts, and then I'll give you the second part of the exercise, okay? So, if you could do me a favor, when you do each do your five I can'ts, if you could be silent, then I'll know when we're finished, but if you just keep chit-chatting, I never know. <laughs> Which is normally what happens after you do the exercise. So, just very quick, I, I, can't, I can't do this, I can't go on Sankirtan, I, I can't give a class, I, I could never learn how to cook, you know, like that. Okay? Five. Partner A, you go first. And you too, Anna. So you should be on partner B by now. 
So if you have three or four, partner A, that's good. If you partner B, it's your turn. It should be very quick. And when you finish, Shanti Shanti. Mona Brat. Anybody need more time? Yes. Should take you. Should take you 30 seconds. Six seconds for each one. Okay, the second part is much more important than the first, so you'll understand, even if you haven't finished yet. So I want you to take those five, and start with partner A again. Take those five, and I'll use myself as an example. I can't get up early, and I want you to change I can't to I choose not to. So then I would say, I choose not to get up early, I can't go on Sankerton, I choose not to get up early. And then as you go through, just kind of feel it intuitively, which one feels more real to you, the I can't or the I choose not to. And I'm not saying for you what it is right or wrong, but that's for you, just to sense if the I can't was an excuse, and I would actually have a choice and I could. So it's very simple, it shouldn't take you very long. Just go through your five and change I can't to I choose not to. exercise with self-evident, and I think we can apply this um, 
It's nice to apply this. I can't control my mind till I choose not to control my mind. And so this is just an exercise you can use anytime you run into the I can't. Now, if I'm working and I go to bed at, at 1 a.m., yeah, I can't get up at 4. I mean, I could, but I'll probably fall asleep on the way to work in my car. So we're not talking about counteracting physical law, but there are many things we think we can't do which are actually choices. So this exercise was just to show you that don't give in to the I can't and, and understand the I decide and the I choices that's operating. So we have one last slide to demonstrate that. When you say I can't control my mind, it means you decided to not control. It means just not to control your mind. Yes. So we have another exercise for you. Are you ready? Yes. Are you enthusiastic? Yes. Are you going to decide to do the next no. exercise? <laughs> Turn to your partner and tell them, I decide. I decide. When Maya comes, I decide. When Maya comes, I decide. Yes. So here's the exercise. I would like you to answer these questions. If you have a phone or a tablet or a computer or something to write on, uh, you can write them. If you're without anything to write on, you can then answer with your partners. Just give the answers to your partner. And then we're going to discuss these answers. This is just for your own self-reflection of where you think your biggest obstacles are, your biggest enemies that you're allowing to harm you in some way, and what you can do about it. And then after you finish the exercise, we will have some sharing and discussion about this. I think it's self-evident. If you have any question about it, you can come up and see me. And all the people on Facebook, you don't have a question. Oh, maybe I'll show them the question. Is this going to work? I don't think I can do it. Huh? Forget it. Go to Zoom. It's on Zoom? Yeah. What's the, can you write the link in? We'll give you the Zoom link, everybody. Can I just give you my phone? You write it in the comments. The first question is one that's going to take the longest to answer. One number is you know, it doesn't have to be your number one, 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 one. It just has to be something that is a problem and you want to work on it. And you have to be a little honest here. And I just want to say this is all confidential. Whatever we share here, we, we sh we're not going to share anywhere else. And whatever you share with your partner is just with your partner. And if you don't even want to share that with your partner, you don't have to. Because it may be very, very private and confidential. So you have to feel safe. This is for your benefit. It doesn't have to be shared unless you want to. So give the first one some meditation. Like what, is, what is something that I feel is an obstacle that I really need to focus on? Especially... Maybe I'm running away from it and I'm afraid to deal with it. I've repressed it and, and I know deep down this is something that is a problem. And I've been resisting it. So that would be that would be what I would do. Find that thing I'm resisting acknowledging, being honest about, mm -hmm. pretending maybe it's not a problem when it is. You ever done that? So this, this is what you have to go through with that first question. And once you get the first question, then it'll be much easier from there on.